Thank you so much, Eileen. If you'd like to follow along with me for our scripture reading today, we'll be reading from Ecclesiastes 8, verses 2 through 4. Ecclesiastes 8, starting with verse 2. I say, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. Do not be hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever pleases him. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Pastor, may the Lord bless you as you share what God has put on your heart. Oh, let's pray together this morning. Father, thank you for bringing us into your house. Father, thank you that you have set a table before us. And every good thing is ours in Jesus Christ. And Father, um, I just pray, Lord, for the people here and for those watching. Lord, you know many of us have burdens that we cannot bear. Many of us have, um, Father, things too big for us. And I pray, Lord, on this, your Sabbath day, that you would unburden us, that you would take those things on your shoulders, that we could give them to you, and that you'd free us, Lord, to be able to rejoice and hear your word in peace. Father, draw near to us, draw near to your people, open our ears to hear your voice. Open my mouth, Lord, to speak your words. And may your word, Father, may your word hit home with each one of us. Right in the place, heal the places that need healing. Bind up the wounds. Extend mercy, Father, to each of us. And life, I pray. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. We've been studying um, salvation through the sanctuary. And our topic today, the title of our message today, the message is the word of a king. Um, we've been studying salvation's blueprint, uh, the plan of salvation as outlined in the symbols of the sanctuary. And at the altar of sacrifice, the sinner finds mercy, he finds forgiveness, he finds that God offers a substitute for his sin, for my sin, and he's set free and made right with God. At the altar, at the labor of washing, he finds a new life. He finds living water bubbling up to new life inside of him in Jesus. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And the last time we talked on this topic, the altar of incense is the place where our prayers are mingled together with faith in Jesus' merits, and they come before God, before the throne of God, as a sweet savor. Today we're going to look at the table of showbread. And the table of showbread is a symbol of God's throne from which his word proceeds. And this word gives life to all who receive it and who obey it. God has set a table before us that will give us life. Um, and when you think about this, to be invited to the table of the king and have the king's food set before us and us be invited to sup with him, to fellowship with him, because it's not just, it's not just two people there eating in silence, right? It is when you come to the table of the king, he shares his heart with you. You are able to share your heart with him. And that's what we're going to be talking about. It's the symbol of the throne of God, yes, but primarily the focus is on the word of God, what God uh, gives to his people. Let me share with you uh, some scriptures that talk about the table of showbread. The Bible says, you shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits shall be its length. Now a cubit is about 18 inches, so this is about a three foot long table. A cubit will be its width, 
and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold all around. You shall make for it a frame of a handbreadth all around. You shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. And you shall make for, the four, for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And you can see in this artist's depiction of it, that's exactly how they have it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overload, overlay them with gold, that the table may be carried with them. And you shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring, and you shall make them of pure gold. And you shall set, set the showbread on the table before me always. Okay, so that's the passage uh, that talks about the altar, I'm sorry, the table of showbread. The table of showbread, I believe, is a symbol for the throne of God in the holy place. And I'll give you five evidences for that this morning. Number one, that the table's position in the sanctuary. Um, notice this. God told Moses where to put that table. You shall set the table outside the veil. In other words, it's not in the holy place, and not in the most holy place, but in the holy place. And the lamp stand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. So the lampstand went on the south, but you shall put the table on the north side. So this table was on the north side. I don't have, I don't have the, um, the passage on the screen for this, but Isaiah chapter 14. Uh, this is where Satan, it's, a, it's the passage that talks about Satan and what his purpose is, what was in his heart. Isaiah 14, verse 13, I'll read this to you. It says this, You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. So God's throne is in the north, and this is where Satan wanted to set his throne also. Um, and so that's one evidence that perhaps uh, it's not conclusive in and of itself, but taken together with the others, which we'll present here, I think it makes a very strong case. Number two, the name of the bread. It's called the show bread. Is there anything else in the English language that we call show bread? There's nothing else that I'm aware of. I believe it's probably an English word that was invented by Tyndale. He invented a couple of words as he was struggling with the Hebrew. Let me share with you what this verse says in the Hebrew. This is kind of a literal rendition. It says, You shall set upon the table bread of the faces before my face always. Some, some uh, Bibles translate this the bread of the presence. In other words, this bread was actually symbolic of the presence of God. And it's interesting how the bread is arranged. Now there are 12 loaves of bread. How many tribes were there? Is there enough bread for all of God's people? Yes. There is enough sustenance, enough of God's word, enough bread to bless all of God's people. But it's interesting they're arranged in two stacks. Now I've seen some pictures of the table of showbread where it says in the Bible, my Bible says rows, six rows of bread. And so people have six individual uh, bread set out and then six others in a row. But you know, when you read how much flour, how big these loaves were, there's not enough room on the three-foot table to have these large loaves laid out in that way. They need to be, they need to be laid out on, on top of each other, I believe. And these two, they symbolize father and son. You know, Jesus said something interesting in John 6. He said, I am the bread of life, which came down from heaven. And he also said, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. And the bread of life is also a symbol for the word of God, which we'll come to here in a little bit. So the bread's name, number three, the blue cloth. Notice here in Numbers 4, verse 7, on the table of showbread, they shall spread a blue cloth and put it on it, the dishes, the pans, the bowls, the pitchers for pouring, and the showbread shall be on it. What is the significance of the color blue within the sanctuary service? It's symbolic of the law of God. You can find this, we won't go to these verses this morning, but in Exodus chapter 24, verse 10 and 12, 
you find that the stable, tables of stone that God wrote the Ten Commandments on are actually tables of sapphire stone that were the pavement at his feet on which his throne was seated. And in the Bible, two verses after it shows the pavement of sapphire stone, God said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of the stone. In the Hebrew, it says the stone. The only stone that has been previously spoken in, in those verses is that sapphire stone, which of course is blue. And also, what color did God tell the Israelites to put into the tassels of their garment to remind them of the law of God? It was the blue. Uh, God told them to put blue thread through the tassels on the corners of their garment to remind them to keep his commandments. Now that wouldn't make any sense unless the commandments were actually written or something connected with them was blue. And indeed, I believe it was. And we notice this, Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 tells us that man shall not live by bread alone, right? But what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. In other words, the law of God, the word of God, the statutes and testimonies of God, they proceed from the mouth of God. They proceed from a king seated upon his throne. The other evidence is that there is a double crown that surrounds the table of showbread. Notice this verse, we read it already. It says this, you shall overlay it with pure gold, you shall make a molding, or a zare is the Hebrew word of gold, all around. And you shall make for it a frame of, of a handbreadth all around. So there were two frames or crowns, you might say. There were two circlets that surrounded this table. And I believe they were symbols of the kingship of God the Father and the priesthood of Jesus Christ. You'll, you'll find out why in a, in a minute from another scripture. But this word here, zare, this molding, I believe is a symbol of the priesthood of Jesus. Because when Aaron, there was a crown that Aaron was supposed to wear. And the root word Zare is found in that crown. Aaron was supposed to wear what was called, he was supposed to have a turban, and then on the turban there was a crown that he was to wear. It was called the Nezer in, in the Hebrew. And so this is connected with the priestly ministry, and this frame, I believe, is connected with the crown of kingship or loyalty or royalty. Notice, notice this verse here in Zechariah with me. Speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Who is the branch? It is Jesus. He is the one who builds the temple of the Lord. We are living stones built upon him. He, yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear the glory. Jesus is that cornerstone of the temple, and we are built upon him. And he... This is still speaking of Jesus. And shall sit and rule on his throne. And he shall be a priest on his throne. Uh, up to this point, you're not sure if Jesus is sitting on his own throne or not, but the last phrase tells us, and the council of peace shall be between them, what? Both. In other words, Jesus is going to be a priest on his father's throne. And if you, go to, um, if you go to many, many scriptures in the New Testament, but also specifically uh, Pro Psalms, Psalms 110, verse 1, God invites Jesus to sit on his throne. David says there, the Lord, uh, God the Father, said to my Lord, Christ Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And in verse 4 of that same psalm, he says, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So putting all of these things together, where did Jesus go when he ascended on high? He sat down at the right hand of his father. His father was seated on his throne. Jesus is seated at the right hand of his father. And the last evidence I want to show you, open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter, we'll start with chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 21. Uh, 
At the end of Jesus' message to the Laodicean church, this is what he says in verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father, what does it say? On his throne. Jesus went to heaven and sat on his father's throne. Jesus is a priest. He's not yet king of kings and lord of lords. When he returns, he does take that office. But now he is a priest. Well, not necessarily. Up until 1844, Jesus was priest upon his father's throne in the holy place. But notice chapter 4. Chapter 4 shows us what John saw in, in, uh, in heaven. Chapter 4, verse 2, John says this, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow above the throne and around in appearance like an emerald. So this, I believe, is speaking of the table of showbread, and only one was seated there at that moment. Jump down to verse 5. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices, and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So remember when Moses was told where to put the, the table of showbread in relationship to the seven branch candlestick? Seven branch candlestick went on the south, the table went on the north, and it was before the table of showbread, just like we're seeing here in Revelation chapter 4. Go with me to Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, this is speaking of Jesus, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So John, in this vision, has seen the seven-branch candlestick. He's, he's made reference or inference. He, hasn't, we have, he doesn't specifically mention the golden altar of incense, but he mentions the prayers of the saints, and he mentions the incense and the bowls that are holding the incense. So he's definitely referencing what's happening in the holy place. Then now notice with me verse... Uh, Chapter 5, verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. There's the moment. Jesus, just having returned from earth, having overcome, is now being enthroned at the right hand of the Father into his office of high priest. And John is looking into heavens and beholding this. There's, another, there's some other evidence too from the book of Revelation. In, John, in Revelation chapter 1, John hears a voice behind him, and when he turns to see the voice, he, he sees the Son of Man. He sees Jesus. But where does he see Jesus? He's standing among the seven candlesticks in chapter 1. And chapter 3 is the seven letters to the seven churches where God, where Jesus is telling the churches he's being a faithful priest because Jesus told us, do you not know that you are the light of the world? Each one of these candlesticks represents one of the churches. And Jesus is being a faithful priest to trim the wicks and pour on the oil and make sure that his church is giving his witness in the world. And each letter is Jesus telling his church what they're doing well and what they need to improve on. In other words, he is keeping the flame of the witness of those churches burning as he works among the candlesticks in chapters 1 through 3. In Revelation 8 and 9, there's an angel that comes and offers incense with the prayers of the saints, and then there are seven trumpets that follow. A trumpet in the Bible is a call to God. It is symbolic of prayer, that God will hear our prayers. And so, and the fact that before the seven, the series of seven opens up, the seven uh, trumpets, you see the angel offering altar, offering the prayers of the saints with incense here, and then the, those seven uh, trumpets follow. So, 
In the first three chapters, you see this article of the, of the uh, sanctuary. In chapter 8 and 9, you see this. But in the introduction to the seven seals, which, one, which article of furniture is it that is represented there in the introduction to the seven seals? It simply says a throne with one seated on it. And I believe that that throne, for all the reasons we've shared this morning, this is a symbol of the throne of God in the holy place. Um, and this is the place where God's word comes to his people. We know that bread is a symbol of God's word. That is clear. I want to take us now to this verse that we looked at, that Larry read for us this morning in Ecclesiastes 8. This was Solomon. He wrote these. He wrote these words. And in the context, he's speaking about an earthly king. He's speaking about himself, but he's giving general advice. But I think this also applies to God, because God is also a king, and he also has commands that come from his throne. Notice what it says. I say, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God, and do not be hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever he pleases. Verse 4, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? I believe this, this table of showbread is a symbol of the throne of God from which his word comes to us. And that word comes with power. And we as a church need to understand and recognize and experience what this power is and what God's intent in his, giving us his word is. God's word has creative power. We know this from the story, from the Genesis story. Um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, I'll read this. Uh, the earth was without form, it was without void. Darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Everything was in chaos. There was nothing yet created. God's Spirit came, and then the Bible tells us in verse 2, verse 3, Then God said, Let there be light. And what happened? And there was light. Where the word of the king is, there is power. God's word spoke, and he brought it to pass. We know the rest of the creation story continues in this way. God spoke, let there be a firmament to divide the waters above from the waters below. And it was so. On the third day, God spoke and said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And it goes on through the rest of creation. He made the sun, moon, and stars. He spoke it and it was so. He, he filled the air above and the, and the sea beneath with, let them teem with every, with every bird of the air and every fish of the sea. And lastly, that the animals, that the earth would bring forth the animals. And he spoke it, and it happened. This is why Psalms 33 tells us this, let all the earth fear the Lord, and let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why? For he spoke and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Where the word of a king is, there is power. God's word has creative power, but it's not only creative power, God's word has redemptive power, power to save. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 8. God's word is not just powerful to create, it is powerful to save. Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to take a look starting with verse 5. Matthew chapter 8 verse 5. The Bible says here, When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word, and my servant, what? 
will be healed. Notice what he says. The centurion continues, For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. This centurion is recognizing that Jesus is a king. And when he speaks, his word is done by his servants. And this, this centurion is saying, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my house. Speak the word and it will be done. God's word is not just creative. It is redemptive. And Jesus spoke the word. Let it be according to your faith. And what does the Bible say? That that man's servant was healed that very hour. Jesus' word is the word of a king. And where that word is, there is power. Turn with me also now to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 33. I got these two. The pictures, and the, the pictures and the scriptures are not lining up on these two. They're actually swapped here. So we're going to Luke chapter 4. Verse 33. Notice this. Now in the synagogue... There was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, look at what they say, what a word is this? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Where Jesus' word is, there is power. Not only do the holy angels go to the servant of the centurion and bring life to him, healing to him, but the evil, even the evil spirits obey the voice of Jesus. Turn with me now to Mark chapter 4. Mark 4, verse 35. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 says this. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Where the word of a king is, there is power. There's creative power in the word of God. There's redemptive power in the Word of God. There is power in the Word of God that I believe we need to tap into. And if we do not believe that there's power in the Word, we will not receive the power. We must believe and we must come expect, we must come to the table of the King expecting something good. We must come there. Notice what Isaiah 55 says. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. God is saying, look, the rain and the snow come down. It waters the earth. It makes it fruitful. It makes it abundant. It gives it a blessing. Notice what he says now. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. 
God's word has power. And God is saying, when the word goes forth from my throne, it will do what I've asked it to do. You know, Madison, giving these little glow tracks that contain the word of God to people, that word will go forth and do what God has purposed it will do. It may not be accepted by the first person who gets it. They may take it out of courtesy. They may throw it on the ground or put it in the garbage can. But that word is not going to return to God void. Somebody else will come along and find that word and it will be the rejoicing of their heart. God's word will, not, will go forth from my mouth. It will not return to me void. It will accomplish what I please. What are the purposes? What purposes does the king have that his word would accomplish? There are at least five that I've, were cho I've chosen for us to look at this morning. Number one, it is a command from the throne that mercy be extended to sinners. Let me show you. This is Psalms 119, verse 58. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful to me. What does it say? Does it, isn't David calling on God to do something for him, a sinner, that God has promised he would do for sinners? To extend mercy. You know, the throne room of God in the most holy place. What was the seat upon which the Shekinah was? What was it called? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. God has ordained that his throne should be the place where sinners find mercy. Another scripture, Psalms 119, verse 41 one, yeah, verse 41, let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, and your salvation according to your word. Salvation and mercy for sinners is ordained to come from the throne of God. How can any of us doubt God's word? He spoke and it happened. He said it and it stood fast. The centurion said, say the word and my servant will be healed. How can we doubt God's word when it comes to our salvation or the mercy or forgiveness? It's come from his throne. Number two, the purposes of God's word are to bring healing. We are broken sinners. Our lives are a twisted tangle of, of emotional dysfunction. We are broken, we are impure, we are, we are not holy. God's word is the only thing that can speak healing to that. Notice what it says. Well, we already looked at this verse. The centurion said, only speak a word and my servant will be healed. God's word is sent forth to heal. Here's another scripture from Psalms 107, verse 19 and 20. In this passage, if you study it in its context, this passage is referring to people that actively rejected the word of God and rebelled against the counsel of the Most High. In other words, this is what God does for the rebels, the absolute rebels. This is what it says. Then, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. He sent his word, and what? He healed them, and he delivered them from their destructions. You know what? Many times, you and I as sinners, we follow down a path that is pleasing to our flesh, and we, we know that it, we shouldn't go that way often, and yet we do anyway. And we get down to the end, and we find, just like the Bible says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is what? The ways of death. And yet, when we're on the doorstep of death, because we rebelled against the words of God, we can cry out in we can cry out to the Lord in our trouble. And this verse tells us he saved them out of their distress. He sent his word and healed them. How many of you need healing? How many, how many of us need healing? God's word can bring that healing. So God has ordained mercy to come from his throne. He's ordained healing to come from his throne. He's also ordained eternal life. Notice what Jesus says. John 5, 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, what does it say? Has everlasting life. Here's another word. Psalms 119, verse 50, your word has given me life. 
You know what? Many people look on the law of God or the word of God as arbitrary. And Satan wants us to look on it as arbitrary. You know what? Many children look on the, what their parents, the rules that they have at their home, and they look on it as arbitrary. I used to be one of those. Why doesn't mom want me to play in the street? That's where all the other kids are playing. That's where I want to go play. Mom just doesn't want me to have any fun. Is that what it was? God's law and his word are not arbitrary. Therefore, our best good. God knows the things that will destroy us. We don't know. You know, one of the biggest jobs that a parent has, especially when their children are just, my daughter's a year and a half years old, Darcy's a year and a half. My biggest job is just keeping her from killing herself. You know what I'm talking about? You know what, they get into everything. They will do, they'll play with anything. They have, you know, this, this last week, she was, uh, she likes to go check out the blackberries. And I don't let her go into the blackberry bushes because there's thorns on those guys this long. Well, one day she got into the blackberry bushes and she's pulling off the, the flowers on the, on the um, there's this giant cane with these huge stickers on it. There she is pulling the flower heads off of those flowers. And, and one of the branches is coming by her bare arm. And she's just kind of annoyed. She keeps poking her. She's like, rah, rah, and I want the flowers. I want the flowers. You know, that's just a little thing. But there's lots of other things that God has put in place so that we don't destroy ourselves. There's a way that seems right to a man. The end thereof is the ways of death. A man doesn't even know his own heart. It's deceitful above all things. This is why God has given us his word. It is a light that shines in a dark place. If we keep God's word, it will lead us to life. And this is the command that's come from the throne. God sends his word from his throne to renew our hearts. Notice these scriptures with me. Psalms 119, 154. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Three times, this is in Psalms 119, that God's word brings revival. It brings renewal. It takes the rebellious heart and begins to write love and obedience on the heart. Here's another parallel passage. Uh, David writes this in Psalms 51, verse 10. God, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. This only happens by the word. The Holy Spirit, working in connection with the Word, begins to write the law of God on the heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He does this work invisibly in the heart, but it is God's Word that brings the renewal. And lastly, the last one we'll look at today, power to overcome sin. God's Word brings this to us. You remember when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness? Forty days he hadn't eaten anything. Now then the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It was God who had appointed Jesus fast. Jesus was waiting for his father to break the fast. And he was not convinced that God had sent this apparent angel to tell him, work a miracle to sustain yourself. Jesus knew that voice and he says, that's the voice of the enemy. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone. How shall man live? By receiving, by obeying, by cherishing every word that comes from God. Not just hearing it, not just preaching it, but by living it, bringing it into the life. And brothers and sisters, are there times when it's difficult to surrender to God in what I want to do and do what He's asked me to do? Sometimes it is the most crucifying thing we can do, is it not? I asked some people to pray for me this week, my wife included. I'm fighting a battle with my own appetite. And my wife sent me to the store, to the grocery store, to pick up some things that she needed. 
And I'd only had breakfast and lunch. It was probably nine o'clock that night. I was hungry. And everything on every shelf, you know they put all this stuff strategically through the grocery store. You know how they do it. If you want something sweet or something salty or something tasty, whatever, it's always there at the checkout stand. And I was wrestling with the flesh. You know how this goes. And I know this stuff is not good for me. But I'd ask people to pray for me in that. I said, how can I? These people are praying for me that, my, that I will not let appetite control me. God, give me the victory. I know there's better food waiting for me at home. Not that it's good to eat at 9 o'clock at night. I know that too. But it's a lot better than donuts and chips and whatever else you find there. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by obeying and bringing his life into conformity to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And notice this. Psalms 119, verse 11. There is power in the word of God to resist the devil. That's why Jesus said it is written. Notice this. Psalms 119, verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. These are the purposes that God has purposed for his word. To extend mercy from his throne. To bring healing to the broken sinner. To give eternal life to the sinner. To renew and create in us new desires. To give us power to overcome. This is what God has set forth at his throne. Church. There's a table that your king has set for you. And on it is the hot, tasty Bread is one of my favorite foods. Bread is delicious. Bread is nutritious. It is good. And this bread, every morning, Jesus sets the table with fresh bread for us. And he invites us. He says, come, eat with me, sit down. You know, it's not just two people eating there silently that can't talk to each other. When you sit down to a meal with someone, you share your heart. They share your heart. You talk about your day. The king has said, will you come and spend time with me? Sit at my table. I will feed you. I will bless you. Do you need mercy? I will give it. Do you need healing? I will bind it up. Do you need eternal life? Do you need a, do you need a renewed heart? Do you need power to overcome today? I have all of that here on the table for you. Why should we not go in the morning every day seeking him in prayer and say, Lord, I will say yes to your invitation. That's what Jesus says to Laodicea. Jesus comes and he knocks on the door. And the Bible says, if any man hears my voice and opens the door to me, what? I will come in and sup with him and he with me. This, and this is not just, this is not an old dead word. A lot of people are saying that today, even in churches. This is the Word of God. This Word is the power of the King's Word. It's the same Word that when He spoke, universes, you know, the Hubble telescope is discovering billions and billions and billions of galaxies. That came from the Word of the throne. And God's Word will come to bring healing, mercy, life, renew us, and give us power to overcome. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that your word, your very word is life itself. Father, I thank you that you have not only provided for our temporal needs, for the bread that is on our tables. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you provided for our spiritual sustenance, that you provided mercy, that you provided healing, that you provided life, that you provided new hearts all by, based on your word, your creative word, and that you will renew us each morning as we come and study your word. Bless your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.